Καλησπέρα σα και καλώ ήρθατε στο τρίτο TEDx Θεσσαλονίκη Discussions. Είμαστε έτοιμοι εδώ να ξεκινήσουμε και να υποδεχτούμε το σημερινό μα καλεσμένο. Πρόκειται να έχουμε σήμερα μαζί μα τον Κωνσταντίνο Κομαίτη, ο οποίο είναι Senior Director of Policy Development and Strategy στο, στο non-profit organization Internet Society, ο οποίο έχει βάση στην Ελβετία. Ο Κωνσταντίνος ε, ήταν ομιλητής μας το 2018 με μία ομιλία που αφορούσε το ίντερνετ, τις βασικές του αρχές και κατά πόσο πρέπει να επικεντρωθούμε και να μην ξεχάσουμε πόσο σημαντικές είναι. Και ε, ο, τε, οι τελευταίοι μήνες αποδεικνύονται εξαιρετικά επίκαιροι σε σχέση με αυτή την ε, ομιλία. Έτσι λοιπόν έχουμε σήμερα μαζί μας τον Κωνσταντίνο Κομαίτη προκειμένου να συζητήσουμε κάποια από τα θέματα τα οποία συναντάμε και προκύπτουν καθημερινά με αφορμή και τη νέα κατάσταση που έχει ήδη διαμορφωθεί τους τελευταίους μήνες τόσο στην Ελλάδα όσο και παγκοσμίως. Να σας ενημερώσω ότι η συζήτηση α, θα γίνει στα αγγλικά α, καθώς ο Κωνσταντίνος α, είναι φυσικά Έλληνας αλλά ζει πάρα πολλά χρόνια στο εξωτερικό, εργάζεται και δουλεύει έξω και θα, ε, θα είναι πολύ καλύτερα να μπορέσει να μας αποδώσει με τον τρόπο που θεωρεί και σωστά το περιεχόμενο αυτής της συζήτησης. Οπότε σήμερα θα ξεκινήσουμε και θα κάνουμε τη συζήτηση στα αγγλικά. Ας υποδεχτούμε τον Κωνσταντίνο Κομαίτη. Hello, Kostadinos. Yes, sir. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> I, already I already informed our TEDxers that this discussion will take place in English, as you as you have been living living and working um, abroad for far too many years, and you feel much more comfortable to actually have this conversation in English. That and also, I am hoping that a lot of colleagues from around the world are joining, so it will be very good for them to participate and understand. So thank you very exactly. much for having me. I am very excited to be back with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kostadinos, uh, for us as well. Uh, at TEDx is an international organization and we ourselves also have a big community inside and outside of Greece. So we're really happy to be reaching out today with uh, this conversation to our audience outside of Greece as well. Now, I was saying that our, um, your talk back in 2018 was concentrated on the Internet and its fundamental values, how it started, how it was developed, what were the main principles that the Internet was built around. Uh, so, one of the statements you had made was that the Internet is a standing of innovation, invitation to all of us to gather, connect, communicate, and exchange ideas. Now, I don't know about you, but I found this more up-to-date than ever, especially in the last months due to this pandemic. We have come closer and Internet has become the only tool that has allowed us to gather, to connect, to co communicate and to exchange ideas. So what, how do you still think that this statement is relevant? So, you know, in the face of COVID-19, we were faced with some pretty imminent questions. Can we, the first question was, can we retain some form of normalcy, meaning, you know, work-wise or social-wise? And the other one, which was more important, especially for governments and governance structures was, is it possible to a certain extent for government to be able and still function in this instance of everybody being locked down, including, you know, um, uh, governmental officials? So all answers, the interesting thing was that all answers seem to be pointing to the Internet, right? Because this is the only tool that we actually have at our disposal that was able to sort of replicate uh, part of what we were doing, um, you know, offline to be doing it online. So it has been actually currently the, the, the biggest experiment, the world's biggest experiment. Uh, and because we have managed to a certain extent to transform a lot of those activities online, entertainment, communication, um, uh, governance, work. So yes, I would say that the statement is still pretty much relevant. Can the internet sustain 
all this use, like we've seen that the, the majority of the population in on this uh, on Earth, and basically the people who had the possibility to actually connect to the internet, they have used this opportunity. So, is this sustainable? Can the internet sustain us all? So. That's a, that's a very interesting question, and that is a really a question that um, a, a lot of technologists and a lot of people, and especially a lot of politicians, have been uh, asking. And in many ways, they have even intervened, uh, believing that the internet cannot support this. Everything uh, from the beginning of this situation up until now demonstrates that the internet, uh, the infrastructure of the internet, the design of the internet is resilient enough to withstand this increased use because we have seen huge uh, use, right, which is really understandable. Uh, and that use was happened throughout the day. Normally, we were seeing a lot of usage of the internet after people ended work uh, uh, where there was a lot of streaming. Uh, but right now, we are seeing that throughout the day, there is this increased and consistent use uh, across the board. The internet can support this. There is no question that the architecture of the internet and, the, and its design was actually intentionally created to support such situations, such pandemics, right? The thing that I keep on saying is that the internet was prepared for COVID-19. The governments, not so much. That is that is true. Yes, indeed, Constantine. Um, let me just say, as we get into this discussion, that um, you will be find at the bottom of, the, of your screen two things. One is ask a question. We're here. You can submit your questions. I will be reading them and then submitting these questions in the course of the discussion to Costantinos so he can reply to all this and we can engage in an indirect conversation with oral audience and our TEDxers. And also you will find polls that we have two, two, three, four polls for you where we would ask you to um, vote. So, so one of the questions, questions is that, that whether the internet, internet has made a difference in the way that you have dealt with the COVID-19 quarantine. So we're looking forward to hearing your, uh, your answers, whether it's yes or a no. Uh, whether this, uh, during this pro process, if you ever ask yourself whether the internet um, could cope with this increasing demand. demand. So basically is what I asked you right before, whether it is sustainable. So let's see what our TEDxers feel about this. And um, um, there is another, another one, one very interesting, interesting regarding privacy and surveillance, surveillance that we're also going to discuss further in our discussion. So, so please go ahead and submit your questions and, and also vote, vote in the polls. And then we'll take this, this inside uh, during our conversation and we'll see how it goes. So, Costadina, I would like to ask you the following. Uh, you're saying that the internet has been the, 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 the world's greatest experiment. And this, relevant, this uh, statement is it indeed more relevant than ever before. However, what is it that really makes the internet so special? What is it that it's the game changer during this period? Because um, you've, you've mentioned a lot of things during your talk, like the values and what's the fundamental pillar and all that. But what does make the internet so special, especially during these times? So we can attribute most of, of, the, of the wonders, if you want, of the internet, most of its power, most of its, uh, you know, what makes the internet great. It's really its architecture and its design, right? Uh, ever since the beginning, uh, the, the architects of the internet made a very conscious choice to design it in a way that is decentralized. That essentially means that there is no central control. There is not a kill switch. Nobody can turn it off and on. And that uh, creates a lot of resiliency and that creates all the opportunities that we have seen. Um, you know, a, a couple of years ago when I was invited by you to give that talk, I was talking about this whole idea of decentralization and the values, as you've mentioned, and it was very abstract. So for a lot of people, it was really difficult to understand why decentralization is so very important. I think that COVID-19 uh, is a perfect example of what makes the internet so powerful and why decentralization uh, in any system 
in any design system, it's so very important. Because imagine the following couple of scenarios, right? Imagine a world without the internet. We would be depending on the telephone system, which is highly centralized, and you cannot, you know, not a lot of people can participate at the same time. So essentially, you would be trying to call your doctor, for instance, and the, the lines will be constantly busy. So you wouldn't be able to get information. Right now, you're able to log in. You know, you're able to go to Google and any other search engine, and you're able to get, retrieve the information you want. And the other scenario is a little bit more bleak, and that is, imagine a centralized internet would mean that somebody had control, that somebody can be one, or it can be many, and those we're referring mainly to governments. What we and have we have seen, seen such examples. We have seen such examples, especially in view of the pandemic, and a lot of governments have actually used their power to limit, to limit or control, let's say, the information, the flow of inside and outside information. And China has been an example of this kind of. Um, let's say, control of the internet? So, yes. So, you know, as we all read the news and we hear the news, there are those rumors that a lot of information did not leave China uh, when it was supposed yeah. to leave and we've, uh, uh, we've lost some precious time. Uh, so th there is this aspect and China's version or understanding of the internet is actually this centralized control where information is very much controlled by the state. Uh, and the state determines what comes in and out. But at the same time, even if we had an internet where a lot of governments were in control, we still would have problems because we've, one of the things that we've seen in COVID-19 is that for government, it has been very, very difficult to coordinate and communicate uh, in, in terms of response. So you can imagine a scenario where, you know, you had a bunch of governments sitting down, trying to decide how we use the internet, what sort of tools we use for the internet, what sort of information we're getting uh, uh, through the internet, it wouldn't have happened. So th the decentralization allows this uh, diffusion of power, essentially, and it, it just goes to everyone and more importantly to the user that is able to, to, to connect, to innovate and do all those things and participate more importantly, especially in such um, um, scenarios like the one we're facing right now. the question we have with, from one of our viewers that says that he would like to hear your view on the decentralized internet. <laughs> so, like so I'm a huge like champion. Indeed. <laughs> Indeed. And I would like to, uh, to point out two different parameters in terms of de the decentralized internet. First, the, the fact that there are discussions about the split of the internet. And people are talking that, you know, maybe in the future, exactly because of the opportunity that the pandemic has different for different approaches, maybe the world will be divided in two different approaches of how to use the internet. And more dis so it won't be as decentralized for everyone. And so I would like your comment on that first. And then I would like to go into the positive things that you already mentioned, the fact that the decentralized internet has given immense opportunities for collaboration and cooperation beyond borders. Yes, uh, so let's start with the first one. Um, one of the things that everybody needs to understand is that you cannot suddenly take the decentralized internet and make it centralized, right? I mean, you cannot change the architecture. The architecture of the internet is what it is. What can happen, however, what governments could do is impose policies and regulations and various measures that essentially, uh, in a way, start centralizing some of the information and the data that gets in. Uh, the perfect example, you know, the, the, the country that has really uh, mastered that is China, where, where it's still connected to the internet, but everything is controlled in terms, that, in terms of the government determining what sort of information gets into the country. But at the same time, the government has allowed three gateways, as we say, to connect to the global internet because, of course, it needs it for commerce and all those things. So 
the the danger mainly will come from governments and policymakers rather than the internet itself the internet itself cannot change the internet itself is designed in a way that will always support decentralization but unless we pay attention and unless we start pushing back then we will see more and more policies trying to you, you know fragment as we say uh, in tech lingo you know, fragment the internet in small islands, where, the, you know, it can be the European Union one, the other one can be in Africa, and so on and so forth. So the geopolitical issues that we're seeing offline have transferred into the internet, and there is a great push and pull currently. Mm -hmm. This is very interesting, because actually that means that the internet is actually a reflection of the society. It's not something different. That's right. Yes. What happens in the rest of the world and the rest of the international relations? We just seeing it de being depicted on the on the internet. That's right, and you know because of the power that the internet carries, the internet, the power that it gives to users, the the power it gives to innovators to be able and do uh, things. Governments, of course, are looking at it from a point of view where you know they're a little bit. Uh, uh, hesitant and resistant to, 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 to why this power doesn't belong to us, because traditionally power structures always fell within governments. And currently there is this tool that, you know, does not allow this concentration uh, of power in the hands of one. Hmm. Okay, uh, let's uh, let's go to this part that you mentioned that uh, exactly because of the, the the main pillar of the internet, which is decentralization, we've seen enormous collaboration and cooperation. This was has always been an opportunity, but it was never used this extensively. And over the last two three months, we've seen an immense use of collaborate of the possibility that internet gives for collaboration and cooperation. And we're talking about the scientific uh, community to start with, uh, but also we've seen this um, also with uh, tech companies and the civil society to find a way to collaborate and work through the internet. So, sorry, uh, uh, okay, uh, yes. so please go on, please finish. No, the, actually, the, the question is like, is this something that happened incidentally because we were forced to make to be, to 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 behave in such a way, or do you think that this will be an opportunity for us to continue and collaborate even more? So this will be a tool that has given us the opportunity to see its potential use through this pandemic. So uh, I, I would really hope to start from you know the latter part of your uh, uh, question. Um, you know, the internet is an outcome of collaboration, right? It was not created by a single individual or even two individuals, uh, even coming from the same, uh, if you want, uh, background. The internet is a collaboration of the private sector. The, the, the government was also funded the early stages of the internet. There were a lot of engineers that collaborated. And then, of course, more and more people started joining this thing that we call the, the internet and were able to contribute in their own unique way to uh, its evolution and where we are right now. You're absolutely right that, uh, you know, in, in your observation that when it comes to COVID-19, we saw this collaboration actually getting, um, getting enhanced and people coming together in many different ways. And we saw different layers of collaboration. Um, you know, when it comes to businesses and companies, we saw them coming together to create a more robust cybersecurity tools because, of course, in such, a, in such a situation, it is pretty normal, it's human nature, that some want to take advantage of it uh, and, you know, they're, uh, to, to, to attack, cyber attacks are in the, on the increase. So companies came together to create those cyber tools that will help uh, vulnerable communities and organizations to deal with this. Uh, we also saw companies, we actually saw two of the biggest competitors, if you think, Google and Apple, coming mm -hmm. together to, cre to create a tool that, is, that will be able to assist health services, public health services, you know, to be able and um, um, notify about infections and who has uh, COVID-19, uh, etc. We also saw, however, infrastructure providers uh, supporting governments mm -hmm. because a lot of those a lot of governments did not have the infrastructure to be able and support all this online interaction and start offering their services online so we saw infrastructure providers 
coming together and also offering tools. And of course, as you said, civil society is always and needs always to be present because it keeps those checks and balances that we will discuss a little bit mm -hmm. later, perhaps, you know, the, mm -hmm. those trade-offs that inevitably happen. Uh, so, yes, all, all that was happening. And at the same time, the scientific community having to deal with something that they didn't know anything about came together be and because of the internet, they were able to coordinate much, much easier and much, much faster than in previous uh, times. Mm -hmm. Yes. So as you said, like, for example, Greece has been also an example of how quickly we came to use the internet and put its use in place, like things that would probably have taken years and they had been planning of doing all this uh, infra online infrastructure for years and it hadn't happened, we suddenly see it taking place in within two months or even less. So and yes, I everybody mean, was like surprised. It's like you know everything was all there, everything was there, everything was already waiting, and we just didn't use it, you know. And we were all very pleasantly surprised. And also maybe we also were surprised by by looking at ourselves and how easily we move to this online world. Well, you know, normally you need a very good excuse to do things. And I think that COVID actually 19, uh, you know, provided that uh, that excuse to Greece. I have been following it very, very uh, closely. Uh, and I have seen actually, yes, the, the great strides that have uh, been made towards digitizing and using the Internet uh, more and more. Of course, you know, the question uh, I believe that everybody asks, really, did we need COVID-19 for this to happen? But yes, you know, even in light of COVID, it was a very good excuse for uh, Greece to taste its capabilities and to realize that, you know, moving online and moving digital, especially for some functions, uh, is a must, right? Because it streamlines mm -hmm. and it really minimizes bureaucracy. So this is, these are the add-ons that are happening because of the internet and it's very good that countries take advantage of them. Mm -hmm. um, you mentioned um, that there are trade-offs in every case, you know, you, you need to take the good with the bad and then you need to try to eliminate against the bad. So in terms even for the scientific community coming together, we thought that a lot of papers were published without going through the proper uh, uh, peer review process. So that, that could also hide some kind of dangers. Then we could have seen like uh, the example you mentioned about Google and Apple coming together with uh, help, helping uh, for the tracing of the COVID-19. A lot of people were saying that this was just another way of you know, tracing and surveilling people. And instead of being the government, it would be the big tech companies. Um, we saw a lot of breaches in terms of cybersecurity. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll share with you something that happened to me two days ago. It just like I received a blackmail email in my email. Um, for misuse of the internet, for example. So I report it to the cybersecurity authorities and we'll see what happens. But, uh, you know, these are the things that you read and never think that they will happen to you as well. So uh, cybersecurity has also been, uh, has taken a lot of attention basically, because since everything is online, then it's also an opportunity for the, let's say, villains to attack the innocent uh, people. Uh, and um, there is a very interesting um, question I will share with you from um, one of our uh, TEDxers. Penny, she, uh, I think it's Penny, she asks, uh, could you please share with us any examples, if any, within the EU of internet restrictions imposed by governments outside any panel related... Oops, I just missed the... Panel related incidents? such as child abuse? Uh, I wouldn't be able to, to, to give you specific examples, especially of child abuse. I can say that uh, in particular in Europe uh, and everywhere in the world, you know, the, the child protection and child pornography, of course, eliminating child pornography is, is a big issue and everybody's working towards uh, that end. 
Um, the, the, the one thing that I, I really hope that everybody understands is that the internet does, did not create child pornography. What the internet did, unlike the, the offline world, is that, you know, it's scaled, right? Because right now you have billions of people communicating with one another. And of course, potentially they can exchange those obscene images much faster. But when we are discussing child pornography, we really need to be very conscious of what we're discussing. And again, this goes back to the trade-offs, right, that we were talking about. There is a very conscious effort, for instance, right now, uh, in the name of child pornography, to break encryption. And encryption is a very, very mm. basic and a very fundamental security tool that we all need because it protects us simple uh, users, our privacy, our communications, and the way we interact with one another. So we need to, you know, the tra those trade-offs, the discussion about those trade-offs is very important, and we need to be very conscious about what we're talking and what we are trying to, um, uh, the solutions that we are trying to find, and whether there are other means to do it. Because dealing with child mm -hmm. pornography, there are so many other ways to do it, uh, but currently we're seeing, for instance, some governments wanting to go, you know, all the way and say, we're breaking encryption. And by the time you break encryption, then all bets are off. Surveillance mm. is on the rise. You can totally see exactly what every single person does on the Internet. And that is a very, very scary scenario. I was reading today, actually, in an article. Um, I don't remember to quote the source, but maybe you, you, you know this or maybe not that this is a discussion that's going currently happening in the US and they're actually voting on this. So it passed the first step of voting, let's say, with only one vote uh, um, pro. So they're hoping that maybe in the next step it will not get the same uh, support because that would mean that the United States, the state, would be free to surveil everyone's activity online without needing a warrant to do so. Is that correct? Uh, that, that is correct. I mean, the legislative That would be an example, I guess. So this what is what I was referring to when I said a government. I think you called them out. Uh -huh. I was trying to be a little more, more discreet, which is fine. This could but... happen to other, to other states as well. This was just one article I read. So it's not that I'm pointing out the US. I'm just saying what I read. But I'm sure this, is, this could not be the only case. But no, basically, currently we're seeing in the U.S. a very concerted effort to, to in the name of child pornography, to break encryption. And uh, the, the legislative process, of course, is, is quite long in the United States. Uh, and mm -hmm. of course, you know, a lot of things are political because they have the big elections coming up in November. But, uh, you know, this is also moving now. We are seeing the Five Eyes, which is essentially the Commonwealth, the United Kingdom, New Zealand, Australia, um, uh, the United States and Canada, that they have been meeting and they are trying to actually do exactly the same thing, start breaking encryption and create those conditions where the, the rights to privacy and the rights to safety and the rights to security are becoming very compromised and are solely in the hands of governments. And one of the polls that refers to the privacy, uh, the question is, do you feel that post-COVID-19 we will get to see less privacy and more surveillance in the Internet? And the, uh, the answer is that 76% of our audience thinks that, yes, this will be the case. Does this also mean that we're going to get more familiar with this and it's going to be, oh, okay, it doesn't mind? What would the trade-off be? Because this is also a very uh, important discussion that happening online currently. Um, that because that COVID-19 and this whole pandemic situation has created a more fertile ground for such um, acts to take place later, even post-COVID. So because something was took place to deal with a pandemic, it would be easier to maintain these measures. That could actually be uh, going against the laws of human rights and privacy and all that. So how do you see this evolving post-COVID, let's say? So I really hope that we don't normalize this and we don't accept mm -hmm. it as, as something that, you know, this is it and we are not doing anything. We, we need to push back and we need to start asking those questions because, again, currently we are being presented with the following dilemma, right? Do you want your privacy or do you want your health? 
And this is a very, very artificial dilemma because you really can have both and you don't need to sacrifice one over the other. Uh, you've mentioned before Google and Apple and those companies, especially Google, you know, they have a track rec record of um, invasions of privacy and collecting users' data and using it for different purposes. However, in this specific instance, the irony is that both of them are working on uh, technology that is essentially decentralized and it protects privacy. And what we're mm. seeing is that governments are actually pressuring them to centralize this technology because they want to be able and collect data. We are seeing this, we, France is leading a call, a very strong call to Google and Apple, telling them you need to centralize this. Australia did it as well, and um, uh, the United Kingdom is doing it as well. But the, the interesting thing of all this is that despite those calls, of course, you know, these apps work. And in Australia, for instance, Everybody was using, you know, the, 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 the government gave them uh, the, the tracking uh, app. They created a, trapping, a tracking app that was highly centralized and it was not working on an iPhone. So they had to change it and make it decentralized because <laughs> what would they do? Would they ask, you know, mm. millions of people to buy new phones because they wanted this uh, to work? So here we're seeing the technology actually offering much better solutions than, than some governments. And there mm -hmm. is a pushback. But unless we as users start pushing back more intensely and actually demanding that those trade-offs, um, um, first of all, do not perpetuate, but also questioning those trade-offs, uh, there is a great possibility that there will be those uh, grabs and we will lose progressively our privacy. And we are talking here about, you know, and we have the GDPR that a lot of the European states mm -hmm. went through a huge painful process trying to implement mm -hmm. it into law. And we see governments actually, uh, what they're calling, occasionally even opposing the GDPR principles. So it's a very interesting uh, debate that currently is happening. And we'll see what's going to mm -hmm. happen post COVID-19. Yes, indeed. Uh, I, I guess, so, you know, when it comes to choosing something, it, can, it depends where you're standing, what, where your shoes are. <laughs> you know, and right now or in the last, uh, two, for the last two months, we've been actually asked to choose between living and surviving and not getting affected and all that instead of giving up a bit of our, you know, freedom, which we thought, okay, will be for a little while. But then I imagine that in the future, in the coming months, if this, uh, as we start getting out of the first shock, then we may be able to appreciate or look at this from a different angle and then actually put down all the facts and see what this means, what are the exact trade-offs, what are the dangers, what are the opportunities as well. Yes, and also trust, you know, and also, as I said, questioning and asking uh, uh, those very difficult questions uh, and do not accept some of those, uh, you know, um, uh, either or um, uh, propositions by uh, governments, right? Again, I go back to say it's not privacy versus public health. You can have both. And mm -hmm. we have seen that the technology can create uh, a situation where you can actually preserve both in a way that can achieve some of the goals with some limitations, mm -hmm. of course, right? Of course, if you have a centralized system, yes, maybe you're able to achieve much better results. But again, is this trade-off worth it in a situation mm -hmm. where this invasion of privacy can ultimately be uh, a continuous thing and actually become something that we normalize and that will be the worst case scenario. Absolutely. Now, I know you're not a cybersecurity expert. <laughs> However, I'm gonna ask you two questions and then you can answer to your knowledge or to your opinion on this. Um, one is whether, do you, would you, oh, sorry, is it possible to suggest some specific practical measures of protection for average internet users against cyber risks, social media attacks, uh, phishing using COVID-19, uh, click jacking in, gen in general? Uh, so, for, for those things, you know, uh, inevitably a, a lot of those things are happening. Uh, you need to have, um, there are some tools that uh, users can use, uh, depending also on where in the world they are. 
I would really recommend that the users use uh, VPNs because that actually, these are the virtual private networks uh, that allow the user to mask their IP address. And their IP address is sort of the, your identity, right? When it comes okay. to your uh, use of the, uh, of the internet. Uh, every single computer gets an IP address and is identified by this thing. So using VPNs, as we call them, uh, you are able to mask uh, this uh, IP address and you're supposed to be somewhere else when in reality you are where you are. Um, the, the, the only advice that I give, and I, this is the advice that I give also to my parents who are not very tech savvy, but they're using mm -hmm. the internet, is do not click on anything that you do not recognize. And currently, uh, especially when it comes to banks and financial institutions, they have made it very, very clear that they will never send an email asking for your password. They will never send an email asking you personal questions. Uh, if you do not, so being a little bit more alert when you're using the internet mm -hmm. is good, but at the same time, you know, being, uh, um, and being a little bit smart, right? Do mm -hmm. not do things that you normally wouldn't do in the offline world. No, I so, exactly. yeah. So I'm going to ask it maybe a silly question, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it anyway. There are no is silly there questions. Any, <laughs> is there anything in the not in the in the way internet exists and functions that could actually work in a pre in a, in a way that can prevent such attacks or help us deal with such cyber attacks? Um, not really. One of the interesting things about the internet is that when it was created, security was not a consideration because it was created between a bunch of engineers that they all knew each other and they were able to communicate and they all trusted each other. And uh, the, the, if you want the virtue and the vice at the same time of the internet is this whole idea of trust. A lot of relationships on the internet are based on trust. And if that trust is broken, then the internet doesn't break. It's just that you do not, uh, you know, you, you do not interconnect, as they say in engineering lingo, with mm -hmm. that person who broke uh, your trust. Uh, ha having said that, especially after 2013, and 2013 was a pivotal moment, if you want, for, for security experts uh, and um, was the Snowden revelations. That's when we all realize that the internet is very much, is not immune to, 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 um, um, to invasions of privacy and cyber attacks. And the engineering community since then is actually working towards um, enhancing security um, and uh, ensuring that the right and appropriate tools are present so that they can protect users who are not technology savvy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, we have a question from early on from Maria, so I'm going to ask it. It's not really relevant to what we're talking right now, but it's an interesting question. Do you believe that the digital campaign made in Greece for stay at home was a big part of his successful fight against COVID? So let me rephrase this question, because since you don't live in Greece, you, I, you may not be able to answer this specific question. But do you think that um, digital campaigns, whether they happen on TV or online, so via the internet, could have uh, could happen in an impactful way in order to have positive results for whatever that campaign may be? Well, I would say yes, right? But that is a logical yes more than, you know, a fact-based uh, yes. Only on the basis that, you know, when you create something digital, you are able to just, you know, shoot it to every single mini medium that is able to absorb it. So it creates some sort of a, uh, you see it everywhere. And by the time you see it everywhere, you start buying into it and you start becoming more and more convinced that this is the way forward. Here we, we also had uh, digital campaigns. Every single country actually in the world, I believe, had mm -hmm. some form of digital campaign simply because they know what... Uh, that currently, especially everybody uses the internet or most of the people use the internet. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy to, 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 to get the message across to people, right? Because it allows this interactivity that we didn't see in previous campaigns, for instance, because we didn't have the mediums to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and we have another question that regards this digitalization in general. It again refers to the to the Greek situation. So it is. Uh, which is your what is your opinion about the new government measures for the digitization of the Greek uh, public authorities? 
um, um, so maybe again, maybe you, again you, you may not have a clear idea of how things happen in Greece, but they have actually put in place this um, platform, online platform, where they have connected all the public services, or this is their aim and their the percentage is quite high at the moment. So whatever you need to do that is related with the public sector, you can go online and get almost nine out of the ten things you need online. So what do you think um, so, about the digitization of, of a state? And let me also bring in, uh, in this discussion the, the example of Estonia, which is a fully almost digitalized state. And we've seen that uh, a few years ago happened. It's not something that happened last year. It's almost a little under than 10 years, I believe. So the, the theory that everything gets digitized and especially governmental services is a very good one, right? Because it re the immediate effect is that it, it really minimizes bureaucracy. And uh, Greece is one of those countries that for many, many years was suffering uh, a lot from bureaucracy, being one of the most bureaucratic countries literally in the world. But as they say, the devil always is in the details. Just because you digitize everything, it doesn't mean that you have the pill that will fix everything. You need to make sure that you have a robust, uh, you have robust security measures, so you're able to protect those public uh, um, uh, documents, and they're not exposed to any form of cyber attacks, uh, or they can be stolen by adversaries. And you know, Greece has adversaries. Um, hmm. Our neighbors, you know, I'm thinking because they have engaged in cyber attacks over the past couple of years. Uh, and, and at the same time, it really depends on what you're asking users to do and how much of the privacy they're giving up and how you, you treat the information, because inevitably they will need to give you some information in order to get access to the documents that they want. But the question is how you treat that information afterwards. Again, I will refer back to the GDPR. The GDPR is does not exclude is not just for businesses it is for everyone privacy is a fundamental right and especially in europe we value privacy much more than any other mm -hmm. uh, uh than any other continent in the world uh, if you compare it with you know the, the the united states we value privacy more than we value speech in this continent and it is very very important that we do not give this up because by the time you give this up or you make even adjustments to how much mm -hmm. you know you can relax privacy that's when we start seeing uh, a lot of the problems happening uh, you've mentioned estonia you're absolutely right estonia is this clear example of, of a country that literally is doing almost everything online including elections uh, in 2019, for instance, 2000, uh, approximately 250,000 people voted over the internet. But, wow. you know, this doesn't also come with a very good realization that in order to do that, they need to have very, very good cybersecurity tools that is able to protect the integrity of elections. Uh, because by the time you move online and you start having elections online, integrity becomes paramount, right? If anything, or anyone can question a little bit that process, then your whole democracy can fall. So, you know, we need to be very careful again, you know, from going from, going from one extreme to the other, and we need to just be mindful of those details that are very important. Mm -hmm. uh, and now that you mentioned elections and online, um... I'll refer again to the US that they're holding elections uh, later in autumn and they are considering having elections online in case this COVID-19 pandemic uh, does not ease down. Uh, so how do you see this uh, as, a, as a possibility? Okay, Estonia has been doing it for years. The US or even other European countries, would that be something that you foresee in the coming years as an, as an option? And even for the Greek elections, there are a lot of people who, a lot of Greeks who were living abroad and could not come back for the elections. They were, they've been asking for online voting. <laughs> uh, here is one uh, of them. So. Uh, yes, I mean, th 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 there will be a trend. We haven't seen, uh, the interesting thing is that we haven't seen the Estonian uh, example uh, being replicated massively uh, around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we are still, we are, 
actually starting having the conversation right now? What is it that we need to do in order to be able and, uh, and to have the internet support elections, right? Uh, because uh, uh, it, really, it really depends on your infrastructure. It really depends on your security tools. And I go back to exactly what I said. If you do not have a very robust system that is able to, to ensure the integrity of elections, then you really should not do it because you're jeopardizing basic democratic principles and you're jeopardizing the, 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 this fundamental right of, of vote that people have. Uh, so there might, it, it might be coming. I am not sure whether it's going to happen as fast as, you know, other things. Um, in the US, this conversation is already creating a little bit of a mess. Uh, but we'll see uh, what's going to happen. Okay, taking this as an opportunity, I want to ask you two things. One is, say that digitization in all fields is the future or is something that's going to be happening. A, we have seen work from home, so teleworking has been the main thing for the last two months. And we've seen a lot of companies and international big tech companies like Twitter and Google, I think, or Microsoft who've been saying that from now on, they will allow people to work from home if they wish to. Um, then we've seen schools and education. We don't know whether universities are gonna open in the for the next of the year for 2020 or even for 2021. Um, a lot of universities and schools are debating now how they can transition to maybe on going online. What would that mean with the actual relations between students and teachers? And then I, I would like your comments on these two things. And also would like us to see whether this is something that's going to be happening. What does that mean for the other half of the population that's not connected to the internet? So that's exactly what I... What, what is the percentage we've been talking about? How, what percentage of the population is actually connected, A, and two, well connected? Yeah, so that's exactly what I want to say. We need to be a little bit cautious here, right? We need to be a little bit cautious that we don't get carried away with what is happening right now and suddenly we forget all about normal life or, you know, social interactions and we just move everything online. This is not the solution to anything. Uh, and I am saying that being a huge fan of the internet. Um, you're absolutely right. First of all, we need to be mindful that... Um, approximately 53 to 54 percent of the global population is currently connected that makes approximately 43 percent a little bit more 45 percent not connected this is a huge percentage still of people that are not able to do this what we're doing right now they're not able to you know uh, to do what other people are doing right now listening to us they're not able to work they're not able to communicate they're not able to entertain themselves so there's still huge work that needs to be done and that works that work going back to collaboration involves everything governments need to support more connectivity and they need to support more robust connectivity they need to support also initiatives that are out there and they seek to create those conditions for connectivity there is a really great example and we've been talking and actually this example is happening in, in Greece. Greece actually yes right? in, in Sarantaporo there is a community uh, of people where you know, the telecommunications companies did not go there because it's not financially, uh, you know, interesting, uh, interesting <laughs> to go there, let's say. Uh, so the local population there said, OK, we need some sort of connectivity. And literally it started from the Yaya of, of Sarandapuro, where the grandchildren were not going back during the summer because they didn't have the internet so they're doing something called community networks where they're coming together and they're putting up antennas and they're sure connectivity and there are a lot of these things happening around the world and the internet society is very supportive of those initiatives but it's not those are not the solution right those are complementary mm -hmm. measures to th the collaboration that needs to happen by governments and by by the private sector in order to be able and ensure that connectivity that is the first thing the second thing is what exactly you've mentioned right even if we have connectivity, how good that connectivity is. Um, there are majorly, as I said, the internet, the design of the internet is able to support all that, but there are, of course, we, we can always do better and we do better. There is a lot of fiber 
that is being laid out in various parts of the world and there is uh, and there it will require collaboration between countries and unfortunately currently the way the world uh, is moving this is becoming increasingly difficult especially for land la landlocked countries which depend for their connectivity mm -hmm from the countries, their neighboring countries, because that's where they get the cables from, you know, the under sea cables, essentially, right? So they oh, need, so true. there are all those things that are in play um, that, you know, uh, of course will affect the way, uh, how fast we will move in some forms of this, you know, replacing some of the offline activities online. Um, I think that you're absolutely right. There are a lot of companies currently jumping into the bandwagon and saying, you know, you can work from home for, for as long as you want. Um, again, mm -hmm. I think it should be, there is always a balance. We cannot be jumping from one extreme to the other because those extremes come with uh, uh, a lot of consequences. And I'm not sure whether you, you're picking it up or whether it makes the news in Greece, but one of the major consequences of this remote work currently are mental health issues. There are a lot of people who are suffering because they're locked down and they're by themselves and they're in front of a screen all the time. So we need to be very, very conscious of uh, what we're asking people to do and how far we're willing to go with all that. Yes, I think what you what is really important out of the, this that you've mentioned is not exactly whether it's work from home or education online or it's like moving our entire life from the uh, from the society outside contacting communicating with people in the way we have been doing it so far and try and taking this as if it's like a ball and we put it in a different field and that's, that's right. online that's right that's right we, I think we this should is what that creates problems basically like the, the screening time the fact that we we start our morning and we sit in front of the computer and we start in the morning and we end up spending all of our time doing all of our interaction whether it's professional or personal through a screen what does happen with personal what does this mean for the personal contact and especially uh I would, I would take it, take it also, also to the education, education sector. sector. As I was so reading I was this, this um, article again, again where people saying that, saying yes, that it's, yes, it's, it's great, great to have the internet to be able to do the online, online courses, courses. But, but there is an, there element, is an element that it's that not is thought of, thought and that it's the that human is factor, factor, the connection that the teacher can have with the student. In terms, in terms of seeing, seeing whether, whether it's tired, tired whether it needs more attention than someone else. Uh, when you just when say, you say hi, hi as someone, someone crosses in front of you leaving the room, different, different kind, kind of, of social, social interactions, interactions as a student and a professor. <laughs> Yes, because, you know, before the internet, I mean, teachers are also pedagogues, right? I mean, my parents are teachers, so uh, mm. they, I, I know exactly, they are, it's not just transferring knowledge, it's about, it's, it's a whole suite of things that you do. So, you know, for the time being, replacing this and using the internet so, so as students continue with, uh, with you know, uh, with um, the, their studies and they don't lose this consistency is great, but you should not replace this because this cannot be, uh, you know, the human interaction can never be replaced. We have a very interesting question from Alberto, so I'm going to go ahead and ask it. According to your experience as a member of the Internet Society, can you describe the main opportunities and main risks of Internet usage in Europe for the upcoming three years? Ooh. And part B? how the AI will change the use of internet. Okay, um, the, let's start with uh, uh, the great risks. I think that the, you know, cybersecurity is, is potentially one of those, uh, of those big risks. Um, content regulation would be the other one, how countries decide to do this, uh, because currently we're seeing again a big effort. And of course, you know, some of that content is awful that is over there and it's very dangerous but again you know how far we're willing to go currently we're seeing that uh you know we're bypassing some of the judicial processes we are taking down content that mm -hmm. might be legitimate in other contexts and we're asking even companies to police the content when they're really not supposed to or legitimized to do that um 
uh, for opportunities, I think that Europe has the potential to, to, to lead in many ways, and it tries to do that through regulation. But again, we need to be very careful, right? Um, the, the, we need to be very conscious how far we're willing to go to, with regulation. And more importantly, we need to be conscious of the unintended consequences that regulation creates to the internet. Because a lot of that regulation can actually change the architecture. And we've discussed that in the beginning, Elena. By the time you start changing this architecture, then all bets are off. This tool that we're using, and it's so very important, it has all this potential, suddenly it becomes uh, a tool that you know you cannot fulfill everything that you can fulfill. Um, in terms of AI, it's going to be a game changer. And again, we need to be very cautious. Uh, we do not want to be, uh, you know, everything currently seems to be moving towards replacing a lot of things with AI. Uh, AI is already being used in many ways for content moderation, and it has been proven to be pro hugely problematic. For instance, AI tools have proven to be discriminatory because they are created by human beings. So they're actually literally picking the, 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 the way we discriminate in our everyday lives. The tools actually also discriminate. So we, again, need to be very conscious of the limitations of AI and the tools. And I would, I would ask everyone that is listening to us just to be very, very cautious of all those things. And, you know, technology is good, but technology comes with limitations as well, right? And it comes also with bad things, and it really depends on how we, human beings, use it. Yes, I mean, the, 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 the fact of uh, one it can be gender gap, the other one is age gap, uh, education gap. There's, there are so many gaps to be considered when AI is used, and exactly as you mentioned, because it's used by humans, and a lot of this discrimination is not happening uh, intentionally because no, we because don't even realize we have these discrimination gaps uh, in us when we make decisions, when we, uh, when we pick, uh, we choose one over the other. Sometimes it doesn't really happen intentionally. It doesn't. You're absolutely right. But some other times it can happen intentionally because the person who designs the AI might actually be a racist. Mm -hmm. And there, inevitably, without even perhaps himself or herself realizing this, they might actually put, you know, create an AI tool that reflects what they think and what they believe. And then, you know, the, this, this whole system gets really uh, upset in many ways. Mm. Well, there are definitely a lot of opportunities and a lot of risks. Because Certainly. for every choice and every decision we make, most of the times there is a trade-off and we really need to consider what the trade-off is and even at, we may be making a decision now that doesn't really endanger much but we need to be able to foresee what this will mean in the future when different conditions are in place how can we really predict that though we can we cannot I'm sorry, you've mentioned the word choice and choice is, is, is very, very important. The choices that we make need to be very, very carefully considered because there are a lot of things at play. And what, you know, if you see everything circles back to collaboration, not one actor can do this alone. Governments designing systems, uh, systems and designing technology or believing that they design technology or believing that they understand technology, especially when it comes to ve a very complex technology like the Internet, is really not happening. They need to bring in the experts, whether it is when they regulate, whether it is when they want to, do, to digitize things, whether it is when they want to do a variety of stuff. They really need to bring the, the, the technical expertise in order to be able and provide that information that is necessary to build those systems in a way that facilitate what they want to facilitate without, without those trade-offs. So, and we as users need to be very mindful and very, very aware that we should not take the internet for granted. And this is one of the things that I really would like our, our TEDxers to, to take with them the internet should not be taken for granted because there are a lot of forces that they want to change it and there are a lot of forces that they want to, to you know, to adjust it to their political views, whatever, whatever those are, right? And as we say, mm -hmm. and as we have seen better yet, 
governments come and go and some of the governments that, you know, some of the countries that were very, very, you know, pro-democracy and very much uh, in favor of, of um, uh, libertarian views, they can actually, a government can come in and upset all that. So mm. the, we, we should be fighting for the internet. Uh, this is the message that I would really like everyone to understand, that we should be fighting for the internet, we should make sure that everybody has access because the opportunities that you can see on the internet, whether it's education, whether it's getting people out of poverty, whether it's actually communicating, the most basic are just immense and it, it would be a huge miss if we did not take advantage of those. So maybe we, we could say this, that since the time that internet was created and all for all the years that it has been used so far and all the challenges that it has faced it remains unchanged the values and fundamentals remain the same their importance becomes even more and more enhanced as we are facing more and more challenges so where are we seeing the internet in the coming years? Do you see any changes? Do you, how do you perceive it? What's its place, basically? Uh, I, I don't want to predict really where the internet is going to go, but I can tell you that there is, there is a danger that we might lose it. At least we might lose, lose the internet that we have uh, gotten used to. Um, you're mm. absolutely right that, you know, uh, majorly the internet uh, remains the same uh, ever since its creation, especially when it comes to the way, to its design. Um, mm. The values behind the internet are more relevant than ever right now, especially with the challenges that we face globally. Uh, but at the same time, unlike um, in the past, what we're seeing is that there is a very concerted effort to grab it and change it, uh, especially by governments. And there is also a very concerted effort by some businesses that they want to use it in order to become bigger and stronger and bigger and stronger. So th there are multiple, if you want, attacks, uh, mm -hmm. and we need to be um, resistant because the internet is resilient, but the internet itself cannot do it, right? It needs it's people. It needs people to participate, it needs people to innovate, and it needs people to question all the time those decisions that are being taken on its behalf. And it's actually a tool. It's not like it's the solution to everything. Precisely. It's a tool, and we have this significant, important, powerful tool to our disposition that we can actually use in different cases with different ways but, but we need to have, have it available, available in order to continue, continue having it available to us freely. We need to protect it, as you say. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. Well, Costandine, I think we can uh, wrap up this uh, wonderful discussion we had today. It's been an hour that you've been with us and answering some of the questions from our TEDxers and people who have uh, following us today and engaging in a very interesting discussion. And my takeaways, I would say that is, first of all, we need to maintain the internet decentralized as it is, because this is what gives power to us and to people who use it. We need to make sure that the equality around internet is expanded. So 53%, five of the total global population is not enough. That, that means that either you or me wouldn't be, uh, here discussing this without the internet so we need to make sure that it's expanded to everyone and we need to fight for it that's exactly uh in 2018 during the tedx talk i just finished by saying please fight for it i'm going to finish <laughs> with exactly the same message please fight for it because it's worth saving and it can really be uh, a game changer personally professionally uh in terms of governance in terms of uh progress uh, and uh, yes, there is a lot of hope that we can place on the internet, but the internet cannot do it by itself. Thank you very much, Constantina. Thank you very much. We wish you all the best. And thank you for being with us a second time. Thank you. Thank you, Constantina. Bye.
Σας ευχαριστούμε πολύ που ήσασταν και σήμερα μαζί μας. Ελπίζουμε πραγματικά να απολαύσατε την συζήτηση. Καλό σας βράδυ.